Hey guys, what's up? This is Nainia from Tech Barrack Solutions and today I am going to talk about virtual reality. Though virtual reality is not a new concept, but I want to take up this topic because I've seen that people are really ignorant about the technology and people just go wow about whatever they see in virtual reality. I want to simply change that perspective. To change that perspective, let's begin with the definition of virtual reality itself. Virtual reality is nothing but a 3D simulated environment which is generated by a computer. Now, when a user is in this environment and the user cannot decipher this virtual environment from the real world, that simply means that it is virtual reality. The concept sounds really simple, but it is really complicated because there are a lot of things that are involved in how you interact with virtual reality and there are a lot of things that go behind delivering a virtual reality experience. We'll talk about that, but before we get on to those things, we need to discuss the categories of virtual reality. These are not standard categories. These are categories which I have defined to make this concept of virtual reality smooth and simple to understand. So the first category is going to be the cheap VR. The second category is going to be economical VR and third category is going to be expensive VR. Cheap VR includes devices like Google Cardboard. It is easily available online for $10 or $15. You will get a printout of the head mount on the cardboard, which on assembling, you can use it as a VR device. You can put in your smartphone and boom, you have VR right in palm of your hands. It's really cheap, but at the same time, it is low quality. It is just a proof of concept that mobile VR experience is totally possible. Next comes the economical VR, which consists of companies like Samsung, Facebook and Google. Samsung and Facebook together in collaboration have come up with Samsung Galaxy Gear VR, which is powered by the technology of Oculus. And it is a much more sturdier head mounted setup in which you can put in your Samsung flagship smartphones and get a VR experience. These devices also come with a controller to control the objects in the scene nowadays. Apart from this, as I said, Google is also a part of the economical VR section or the category and they have the Google Daydream. Google Daydream will cost you $79. It's just a head mount, but it's a much more broader concept than Samsung Galaxy Gear VR. So Google has set down the specifications that is required by a smartphone to be a part of Daydream VR concept. So if the smartphone has those specifications, it can be used with a Daydream head mounted setup to deliver a high quality mobile VR experience. So that's like the Google Daydream. And one thing which I forgot was the cost of Samsung Galaxy Gear VR. It will cost you $99. Now comes the expensive VR, which is led by Facebook and HTC and Valve. So HTC and Valve together have HTC Vive. Facebook uh, has its own company, uh, Oculus, which has Oculus Touch. Now, both these devices are high-end VR, which are expensive. They cost about $800, but at the same time, you need a PC powerful enough to deliver good VR experience to these devices. So the PC will cost you like $1,000. So the total setup comes around to $2,000. We spoke a lot about what is virtual reality and its categories. Now it's time to dive deep into what happens behind delivering a good virtual reality experience. So let's talk about displays first. Displays have a particular set of resolution and also a particular latency. Latency is defined as delay in delivering something. So in case of a display, it would be delivering a picture or video to a user. So whenever you're buying a PC monitor or a television, it will always say that it has a latency of one milliseconds or some seven milliseconds. It simply is trying to say that your display will deliver the picture after like seven milliseconds of delay. Now, someone will be like seven milliseconds is nothing. It's really small, but believe me, it's a lot when it comes to virtual reality. And this also brings us to the next concept that is photon motion to photon latency. Now motion to photon latency is the amount of time it takes for the display to reflect the change once the user moves his head. So let's say I was looking straight at you guys. And now let's say I move my head 45 degrees towards the Northwest and it was really fast. 
now if the device is not able to change the picture to that scene instantly that means i'm going to face motion sickness and this time interval that it takes to switch from where i was looking to where i am looking now is basically motion to photon latency and if this is more than 20 milliseconds it's bad it's going to cause motion sickness display resolutions play a very important role in delivering a good vr experience in case of virtual reality we have a stereoscopic display so the resolution gets divided by half so if you have a resolution of 1920 by 1080 it simply becomes 960 by 540 per eye iphone 4 had a resolution of 960 by 640 which looked amazing at a distance of 15 inches now that's the important parameter you are looking at the iphone 4 display at a distance of approximately 15 inches but when it comes to virtual reality you are looking at the display and experiencing virtual reality at a distance of 2 to 3 inches and the dynamics completely changes you need a very high resolution to make the person feel immersed in the virtual reality experience and to drive that kind of resolution you need good gpus and good cpus and it adds more overhead for the gpu to deliver at that resolution at 90 frames per second now if the resolution in that same position was 9 960 by 540 instead of 4k it would be easier for the gpu so again your expenditure is increasing if you want a better vr experience displays come with a refresh rate now refresh rate is simply the frequency at which the display fetches the images from the graphic card now imagine an idealistic situation where the amount of time it takes for the graphic card to deliver a image is 0 milliseconds and the amount of time it takes for pixel switching on the display is 0 milliseconds then the amount of time required to grab a image by the display from the graphic card is calculated as 1000 divided by refresh rate and let's say for example if the re refresh rate of the display is 90 hertz then the latency to grab the image would come down to 1000 divided by 90 that is 11.11 .11 milliseconds and that's an idealistic situations how do you reduce this latencies first thing is reduce the pixel switching time pixel switching is simply the amount of time it takes to load all the pixels on your display and you can reduce it by using better technologies like oleds because it's got faster pixel switching now what about the idealistic situations which i just spoke about that the graphic card delivering at 0 milliseconds you know how do you reduce that time that is a, that is at host level that is at the pc level so for that you need really good algorithms for your cpu and the graphic card you need to change their architectures i'm just going to give you two small tiny bits of examples of these so one thing that can be done is reducing the buffering at the gpu level so what happens is the cpu takes or uh, what has to be rendered and sends it out as a command so it will find in all the rendering commands of the images and then the gpu will keep on buffering it that is gpu will keep on doing the draw commands and buffer itself up so the idea is to do a render and a draw a render and a draw rather than making the gpu buffer all the draw commands the next thing is asynchronous time warping what is it it sounds really crazy but it's not that crazy as it sounds so time asynchronous time warping is simply predicting the frames by using the previous and the previous uh, frame information and when you're predicting frames you're basically reducing the overhead on your gpu and cpu because they have to predict half the number of frames rather than predicting all the frames so if you were supposed to be delivering 90 frames per second now the gpu will have to predict half the number of frames and deliver 45 frames per second and that's very simple on a broader level you can also start predicting the tracking that is you can start predicting the head movements the controller movements etc and if you start doing that you start improving uh, the speed and efficiency at which the cpu and the gpu works In this entire video I spoke only about the visual experience of virtual reality but when I defined virtual reality I said the user should not be able to decipher between the virtual world and the real world to make that possible you need to bring in all the human senses into play like if the virtual experience has 
blood in the environment in the virtual environment the user should smell blood how do you bring in weather variations and how do you make the user feel these weather variations how do you make the user feel that he or she is touching some object in the virtual environment so all these things are being researched virtual reality is not as simple as it sounds and there are a lot of things that go behind it so just change your perspective whenever you are experiencing a new virtual reality experience think about all these things that happen in the background and then think whether it is a wow or an okay experience and one point i want to make over here is that even the high end vr devices like oculus touch and htc vive they are not at par they are just able to provide us a decent vr experience but they don't have the specifications to deliver a truly good vr experience that's it with this video guys i really hope you liked it please rate comment subscribe and visit techbarrack.com